So we're going to start to talk about the design layers now. And we're going to start with the design layer for water. Now, the uppermost area of the watershed is critical because it's typically steeper. And everything that happens up here affects the flow of water all the way down through the whole system. So this is really considered the water catchment zone. It's typically kept in a forest or savanna and kept in a state where water soaks into the soil to slowly feed the lands below. Now, the next level down from the water catchment zone is what we call the water retention zone. This is the place where the slope breaks and changes from steeper, where you can see the contour lines closer together, to more gentle, where the contour lines start to spread apart. Now at this slope break, where we go from steeper to more gentle, is a place that we call the key point. Now, the key point is where we begin the water retention zone. From the key point, there's a level elevation line that comes out. So the key point is right here in the valley where we go from the lines being close together, suddenly the slope breaks, the lines become farther apart. We can see this in each one of our valleys right here, where it gets from more, goes from more steep to being more gentle. Right? Now from these key points, there's actually a level line that comes out, and this is the key line of the valley. And that key line represents the water level in our key point pond which is the first pond that we're gonna demonstrate in our model. So I've highlighted the key points and key lines in each of these three valleys, right? And so now I'm gonna construct the ponds, the key point ponds for you to see how those work. Okay, so here's our first pond. And now I'm gonna go and fill it up with water. Now you can see how it really makes sense that this is one of the highest locations that we can put upon the landscape because otherwise we're on this steeper slope. So that first place where the slope breaks and it begins to become gentle is really oftentimes, if the soil conditions are right, an ideal place to place a pond because look how high this pond is in relation to the next level down that we'll look at later. So we'll do some more work now in the water retention zone. I've created a key point pond in the next primary valley over, right? Now here's the interesting thing. As the mountain range descends from the higher to the lower peaks, so the height of these key points also is descending. So if we follow this contour line around, we can see that this key point is actually in a higher location than this one, which means that we can actually take the overflow from this key point pond and wrap it around the ridge to fill the next key point pond over. So you can see that water can actually move from this key point location around the ridge down into the next key point. Now when PA Yeomans developed this land patterning, uh, the title of one of his uh, most well-known books is Water for Every Farm. So the idea was to drought-proof farms, keeping water as high in the landscape as possible. So here, we've got both of these catchments feeding these ponds and the overflow of this pond still maintaining this high level in the landscape above all these other areas below. Over here, we have another key point here, and we can also intercept the flow of water at a key point and bring it out to a different location like a ridge where it can be stored there instead of in the valley form. Now you can see here that we've intercepted water flowing down through the watershed at the key point and we're bringing it out to this ridge pond. Now a ridge is certainly a safer place to have water stored in the event of an extreme rainfall event where a flash flood can break through at the key point and not flow around the ridge to blow out the pond there. So let's look at 
where when we have a massive force of water, the water really goes in this landscape. So you can see that the force of the water still really goes down through the valleys. So in a major historic rain event, the key point ponds are still gonna be on the receiving end of the force of this water here. However, the breakage would happen in the valley. It's not necessarily gonna bring water out to the ridge and uh, create a catastrophic dam failure there. So below the key point, there are also other locations within the valleys and on the ridges. And these locations vary on the unique topography and geology of each site. We go more deeply into the specifics of different types of dams in another presentation for this course. But I'll build a, a few more dams in here to show some popular uh, dam sites. All right, so I've made a couple more ponds in a very popular location that we would find ponds, which is down lower in the valley where we get a lot of water stored for uh, not as much um, soil moved, right? So it's a very economic place to put ponds and uh, it's a very popular location to find them in. So we've got the water retention zone in here and below the water retention zone, we have the irrigation zone. Now the irrigation zone is the whole area of land that starts below the highest pond that we can use to irrigate with gravity. So really, below these key point ponds, all this ground below there, we would consider the irrigation zone. Now, in the key line pattern geometry, there are certain lines of cultivation within this irrigation zone that are laid out on a pattern where they are sloped slightly off contour from the valley forms in the landscape out to the ridge forms in the landscape. These key line pattern cultivation lines serve the purpose of very gently drifting surface runoff out from the wetter valleys, out towards the drier ridges during very heavy rains, with the result of hydrating the ridges and more equally hydrating the entire landscape. So I've put in these uh, key line cultivation patterns. And you can see that these green lines slope subtly from the valley forms and they slope out towards the ridge forms. You can see that they cross the contours, meaning that if this was a hose and you put water in, it would actually drain out to the ridge from the valley. Now, what do these green lines actually represent? Well, they may represent the uh, pattern uh, that you would run a cultivate piece of equipment like a plow across the landscape. Uh, it may, they may represent the rows of a vineyard or the rows of an orchard. The point is when you get a really heavy rain that comes and flows down through this landscape and you actually get sheet flow and you get lots of water moving through here, the point is that the water will hit the cultivation patterns. And it's not that these patterns will actually drain water out to the ridges, but there'll be a subtle shift of water out towards the ridges instead of from the ridges towards the valleys. And what this does is it creates more surface area contact between water and soil, with the result being that more water soaks into the landscape out towards the drier ridges instead of flowing right down into the valley forms. And we'll talk more about that later as well. So we have the water catchment zone up here. We have the water storage zone down here. We have the irrigation zone below the water storage zone. And then below the irrigation zone, we have the water reconstitution zone. Now, reconstitution is defined as restoring to a former condition by adding water. So this is where we maximize wetlands and wildlife. At the lowest points in the system, we build more water storages, if appropriate, and forest with riparian species. So as these valleys join together below the primary valleys, in the secondary valley, they meet in a creek, stream, or river. And that's also a really important part of the reconstitution zone and an important piece of habitat in every ecosystem. 
So you can see here, we've put some larger trees down there in the creek to demonstrate the uh, important habitat element. And also, we showed further vegetation in these valleys between the ponds to represent uh, typically native or riparian species coming up. That's all part of this water reconstitution zone. So in summary, we have the main ridge and we have the primary ridges, the spine and the arms that create primary valleys, right? And each of these valleys are hydrologic land units. Within these watersheds, we have different zones of design. We've got the water catchment area up here, the steeper slopes. We have the water retention area where we put our highest water catchment zones. We have our irrigation zone below our water retention zone. And then at the bottom of the system and up the arms, we have the water reconstitution zones. Now it's important to note that there are laws on every level, city, county, state, and federal that govern the use of water. For example, on the city water, on the city level, there might be ordinances about downspouts and your site's connection to the storm drain system. On the county level, there could be rules about alteration of roadside drainage ditches. On the state level, there are water rights and rules about diverting, impounding, and using surface waters. On the federal and state level, there's laws governing introduction of exotic aquatic species that could become loose in natural streams and lakes. So, you really have to do due diligence in order to make sure that you're following laws when you do water manipulation, right? There's also a lot of um, laws around wetlands and disturbance of wetlands as well, your, your potential to impact them. So there's so many regulations um, surrounding water and impact on wetlands that you really need to check and do your due diligence before doing any kind of major disturbance. So I'm showing you this idealized landscape here and you may or may not be able to um, implement something to this magnitude where you are depending on your local uh, regulations. So for our next presentation, we're gonna look at more layers of design to add to our system that we've got going. We're gonna look at roads, trees, and fencing. So stay tuned.